A very good afternoon and welcome to In Biosis webinar lecture series 17, 2021. I am Dr. Murni Nazira Saryan, your moderator for today's webinar. I hope the video has provided you with some background. So, for those who are interested to collaborate with us, you are most welcome to do so. Feel free to browse In Biosis webinar and social media for the latest updates and info. I feel so grateful today that all of us are granted good health and time to attend our webinar series. There will be many more webinars to come and I hope all of you will join again in the future. In Biosis webinar series is established to provide a knowledge and research experience sharing platform to ensure we are still connected with each other and stay motivated in our research despite this sudden pandemic. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our honorable speaker for today, Dr. Chin Sun Pan from National University of Singapore. Allow me to share with you Dr. Chin Sun Pan's uh, CV. Chin Sun was born in Pahang, Malaysia, and he is a big fan of NMR spectroscopy. In 2018, he obtained his PhD from University of Malaysia Sabah for investigating marine soft coral derived natural product. In 2018 and 2019, being a visiting fellow at the University of Western Australia, he was first exposed to genomics. He was then awarded a JSPS, which is Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science Postdoctoral Fellow for 2019-2021 at Hokkaido University for investigating cyanobacterial peptides. And now he is a research fellow at National University of Singapore. Let us welcome Dr. Chin Sun Pan to share his research finding. The floor is yours. All right, I will share my screen. It's okay. Good. Okay. So, uh, thank you for the generous introduction. So, today I'll be talking about cyanobacterial natural products and penetrated peptides. So, I, I know that you have already introduced myself, but I would like to just a quick show of the map. So, I, I, I get my uh, undergrad and PhD in English in Malaysia Sapa. So, I graduated two years ago. So if you look at this map, there are a good position, geographical strategy to get the marine organism because the biodiversity is, is really high at this area. So what I'm been work, I mean what I what our group have been working on is the marine organisms such as soft coral, you get this type of chemistry, or the seaweed, you get this, and spines. So after I graduated from my show. Uh, sorry, Dr. Dr. Chin Sun. Uh, I think, uh, can you change your slide to presenter? Presenter view? You, you, you can't see? I can see, but I also see the, the script, the notes. Is this better? Uh, yes, this one is better. Thank oh you. <laughs> okay, um, okay, no problem. So uh, after I finished, I went to the Australia as a visiting fellow. And that time we were investigating the fungus chemistry and try to connect the chemistry to genes. After that, I went to the Japan as a JSPS postdoc fellow. So, so my focus is, is changing from the fungus to cyanobacteria and checking the chemistry and connect their genes. So right now, I'm a research fellow at National University of Singapore. So we're doing in an opposite way. So this is my faculty. So we're doing in an opposite way uh, by translating the genes back to the chemistry. So now, if you look at the this, green color stuff at here. So this one is a cyanobacteria. So this happened 
is because of the overgrowth of cyanobacteria. So when them overgrow of cyanobacteria, then produce some kind of toxic. So the toxic could kill the aquatic organism and also human being. So this phenomena is called the red tide or algal bloom. So the toxic I'm talking about is not as from the secondary metabolism, it's a from a primary metabolism. So if you look at the primary metabolism, we always have to go back to the, the citric acid cycle. So this PEP cycle can be found in most of the living organism. So what it does is to, to um to break down the carbohydrate into the useful energy. So when them doing so, you see the glucose is when them doing so, they create a bunch of intermediate like this one, alpha ketoglutarate or ACT coenzyme A. So this intermediate is actually still by the secondary pathway to build a more complex chemical structure such as this one. So, so this secondary metabolism still in the intermediate from primary metabolism to build this type of complex chemical structure is called natural products or secondary metabolites. So this is the field and this is the, the key topic of today about natural product. And this is how they produce. So back to here, the toxin I'm talking about is the secondary, this from the secondary metabolism, and these are all secondary metabolite, and it's a cyanobacterial toxin. So not all the toxins are bad for the human. Some are really good for the human well-being. So let me give you an example. So some of them can be used for the drugs discovery, such as this one, Dolastatin. Tank. It's the most famous example, lecture product from cyanobacteria. So it has been undergone clinical trial and some development from the industry to make a commercial drug that are now using in the world for the treatment of human disease. So it is clear that the natural product have a value in medicine, but you would say that nat without natural product, many people will be starved and hungry because natural products can be used for agriculture, agrochemical fuel to protect the crops. And besides that, natural product can be used to satisfy the human needs, such as the fields of the pending. So what I wanted to say is natural products have a great impact on our life. But for now, we want to focus on one type of natural product that is produced by grapes. So before I go into that, I would like to briefly explain this one. So this is a DNA molecule, and by and then if I transcript, it will have a mRNA, and if you see. Uh, this three nucleotide sequence, TDT, it can be translated into an uh, amino acid, such as this one. This is the, this is the phenylalanine amino acid, and this is the structure. So usually, uh, we are, I mean, phenylalanine or phenylalanine can be represented by FPHG or a single letter as a F. So you're going to see this a lot. So, yeah. So now I explain how the cyanobacteria natural product, how it's produced in the living cells of cyanobacteria. So, lips is called ribosomal synthesis and post translational modified peptides. So, this is a large group of natural product. So, it was described. In the paper that lips is starting with this, 
as a precursor peptide. So precursor peptide consists of three fragments. One is reader peptide, core peptide, and follower peptide. So a protein will come here and bind to the leader peptide because that's a recognition sequence at here. The protein recognizes and bind to the leader peptide, and it will start process. When it comes to here, the protein will modify the core peptide into a modified peptide. So that's how it goes for post translational modification. So after you modify the peptide, a different protein will come here and recognize the signal at here and bind to this. And it will cut off the leader peptide and also the follow peptide. And this will produce a mature mix. And this is what the natural product. Many organisms produce this mature mix for the ecological reason. So, so the lips is very big natural product. And the one of the family that are, we are focusing on is the cyanobactin. So in this family of natural product from the lips is, is starting with the, this biosynthetic gene cluster. So if you see here, the PAGE, PAGE, is uncoated of a region of I mean, I mean nucleotide sequence and can be transcripted into the MRN and translated by the ribosome into a polypeptide. So this polypeptide will be processed by the adjacent genes such as PEPD or PEPA or PEPG to get a final mix or final product, which is Butterlamide A and Butterlamide C. So this is the description of the cyanobactin. So I guess uh, now we have um, settled the introduction of natural products in this application and also the genomic background of the cyanobactin natural product. So now I'm going to share the, the work that we have done in the Japan Hokkaido University during my JSPS postdoc fellowship. If you look at this picture here, this is how we culture the cyanobacteria. So this loam is very big. We usually culture 200 or 300 or 400 liters of this cyanobacteria in order to get, uh, in order to purify the natural products. So the same, my sample is this one, Mycosis aeruginosa, this 88. So this sample is have been well known. A lot of paper have been published from this strand. So this cyanobacteria could produce a lot of different natural products, such as toxin or this mycobactin or another or a cyanobactin, kawaguchi pectin, like this one. So my sample is this one. So what I found is we found three pigs here, and this of them is supplied by 68 delton, which can be represented by this red color fragment. So this is plenty group with five carbon chains. So we then quickly do a do a MR structure and collect the MR data. Do the MR structure, we connect all the amino acid into a into octapeptide, cyclic octapeptide, and we found uh, the plenty glow is attached to this arginine residue. And then the absolute configuration of this natural product is determined by the MAFPE analysis, basically just by the standard and inject into the HPLC and by comparing the natural uh, retention time. So, so all, all of that work is done 
in the environment of science faculty under Dr. Fumi Ogino professor. So I realized that if you look at this part, I realized that this guanidine based generation is quite unique. This moiety is, is cannot be found in anywhere. I mean, similar example in natural product. So, so I propose to do more detailed work on that by going into the genomic. So because of that, I've been going in between laboratory in Hokkaido University. So we're doing the genomic stuff in the faculty of pharmacy under Professor Tosuyuki Wakimodo. So as a result of our collaboration, we managed to publish number one journal in chemistry, Journal of American Chemical Society. So all this work is about connecting the chemistry to the genes and also characterize the enzyme. So first, we want to connect the chemistry to genes. We want to determine the this compound, this natural product by synthetic pathway. So like I say, the, the, the sample has been well-known study. So people have been published in this paper. This is number one paper in Germany, chemistry, Ange one. So this sample has been published and including the genomic data that have been deposited in the NBCI database. So we found that and we try to uh, locate the, the precursor peptide of this natural product but we cannot file. We only can find a gene LGCF, but there's no precursor peptide in the genetic locus. So what we do is we really sequence the entire strand and we found the missing pieces. If you see here, we extend this region and found the missing pieces and we found the whole gene cluster AGCE, which is the precursor peptide of this one. So with that, because we have the whole genome sequence, what we we, we able to found the, the gene cluster, but we also we, we are not sure why there's a two copy as I show it here, and the two copy of Kawaguchi pectin at here. So we just proceed to determine the biosynthetic pathway by starting from this AGCE. So we hypothesize that AGCE is uncoating the precursor peptide as I show it here. So there's a leader peptide, a core peptide and follower peptide as I introduced in the, in the, in the background just now. So, and then there's a, in the genome, there's also a Kawaguchi pectin gene cluster at here, you can see. So it also making this cyanopectin structure and published in Ange. So usually the gene cluster for leaves have a peptidase that cutting off this type of bleeder peptide or follower peptide, such as KGBA and KGBG. But what we found on of our gene cluster is that the Franklin region of this AGCE gene bias in the gene cluster do not have such peptidase in the nearby region. So we propose that AGC gene cluster might sh sharing the, the peptidase from a form of very distant far away gene cluster such as KGB. But KGB gene cluster, which is Kawaguchi pectin. If you can see here, the highlighted in blue color, these are the recognition sequence for the protein to bind. And it's look very similar as to our precursor peptide. So we propose that the AGCE hijack in the KGB air to cut off the leader peptide and also continue to hijack another gene, another protein, which is KGBG to cut off this one and make a cyclic structure. After making this cyclic structure, which we 
name as Aziz Lamite C, is continued to process by AGCF, which is this gene, and doing the veneration at here. And then it doesn't solve, but it continues for second law and making the veneration at here. So this is our proposal. So after that, we do a testing. So the result here is showing that when co-expression co of the gene of AGCD together with the KGB A and KGB G, we could get this structure. So this partially uh, supported our hypothesis that AGC biosynthetic gene cluster of AGC mite is hijacking the genes from Kawaguchi Pedin gene cluster, which are located far away from each other. So we also do the in vitro assay by purifying the protein of KGBG and using the substrate of the this, this sub, 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 substrate. So we mix the substrate together with the purified protein. We found there's a changer and produce this compound chain. And again, this support the, our hypothesis. And this is the SFH of the protein purification. So this phenomena is, is uncommon. Usually peptide maturation is, is usually follow the collinearity rule. It means all the genes are clustered together nearby to each other. But our case is our gene cluster is hijacking another gene cluster, which are located far away to process the peptide. And another example that I published is this one, seedling air, which also hijacking the, another gene from far away to process the peptide. So only one example can be shown here. So that, that explains the biosynthetic pathway of the of our structure, natural product, agisilamide. So now I will explain the AGCF, which is a Benny transferase. So this result here show that we testing the Benny transferase AGCF using the substrate number three, which is this structure. So we mix together and doing the time cost experiment, we found that the substrate non benerator product is starting to convert to a mono benerator product. When it starts to convert to mono benerator product, which is compound two right here, it become it will serve as a substrate for compound for product three. So, so the second law, the two law of veneration can be completed in one or two hours as shown in this time cost experiment. So that would that would allow us to catalyze the protein function, AGCF, Benny transferase, which, which catalyzes the veneration on this agile residue. So why why we are doing this? If you look at here, these are the benefit of uh, no, this pyrogenetic analysis of the cyanobacterium and the transferase. So we can see why we're doing this is our protein here is actually separate from all the other plate of the benefit transferase. It's a quite unique and it stands a lot here. The AGCF is catalyzed the veneration on the arginine unit and a guanidine moiety. If you see, all the other reported venetic transferase are catalyzed venetation on the tyroxine, amino acid, or tryptophan, or serine, or tyronine. Therefore, our discovery has expanded the chemical space of the cyanobacteria venetic transferase to the arginine subunit. So we then collect all the sequence of the Benny transferase using AGCF quality 
So we collect all the sequence of this protein and do a multiple sequence alignment and construct a sequence remedy network. As you can see here, the network. So this allow us to see the protein function space and which has expanded to uncharacterized penny transferase. You can see uh, this cluster is PATF, penny transferase. And this cluster is our, our protein, AGCF, which catalyzes the original residue. And these are uncharacterized penny transferase. So it's so there's a high potential to explore a new penny transferase from cyanobacteria that get, can catalyze a unique chemical reaction that are not reported until today. So if we look closely in our net uh, cluster of this AGF of a protein, so you can see this circle is represent the, the amino the genome of our strand and the amino the protein amino acids. So we, we check the Fengi region of the genetic occurs. We found the precursor peptide, and this is our precursor peptide. You can see the follow peptide is same to the other circle. And the core peptide is different. The core peptide is the natural product that will be uh, processed by the lips. So we can see that there's a diversity of the cyclic peptide here that, that are unexplored with a functionality of R as a base penetration. See the R is the arginine and K is the lysine. So it's look like there's an, there's different penny transferase that are similar to our AGCF penny transferase that can catalyze penetration on the charge and amino acid such as arginine, lysine, or other arginine in a cyclic peptide. So with that, I'm showing the timeline of the catalyzed cyanobactin penetransferase. So it's all started way back in 2011. So this LYNF is the first cyanobactin penetransferase that had been published in 2011. And now it's 2021, which already been 10 years. You can see that the MAPP is a benelated carbon with five carbon and GPP have 10 carbon. So what I'm trying to show here is that during the timeline, all the discovered Benny transferase are very strict selectivity to their Benny donor, whether them accept the MAPP, five carbon Benny group, or them accept GPP, 10 carbon blending group. So it will not accept both, but in our cases, it can accept GPP. So how do we know that? We do the experiment and these are the results. So this result, we, we tested on the GPP, 10 carbon and FPP, 15 carbon. And we show that the substrate can actually accept the brandy donor of GPP, which is 10 carbon, and this is a small bit here. And we characterize the structure using MSMS to support the benetration here. So this will support that our Benny transferase is quite unique. This is, this is not strictly only accept the DMPP, but also it could accept the GPP. So the other thing that we do is we try to determine the how the Benny transferase can accept GPP or the MAPP. What's the difference of the Benny transferase in terms of amino acid sequence? So we found a paper that published in JAX. So in 2018, so this paper tell us that by mutation of this amino acid, they analyze at, at the position of 222, 
to to a uh, lysine, uh, no, no, to a uh, alanine or glycine, it could change the Blennie donor from from the DMBB to GBB. So what the conclusion is by changing this Blennie alanine to alanine, it significantly increase the binding bucket of the protein, so it can accept a large, larger plenty donor. So a sequence alignment of our protein HCF with the other plenty transferase that are specially accepting the GBP, we found this residue adhere usually have a smaller amino acids such as glycine. So in straight of Bucky amino acid, which is Fanny Alanine in PET F, that only accept the MVP. So our conclusion, of course, we, we didn't do the experiment, but our conclusion that if we create a mutant for AGCF C219 G, it will increase this product because it increased the space to accept the GBB planning donor. And then we try to determine the catalytic residue. We found a paper that published in GNAS in 2016. So this paper with a crystal structure of the protein PEPF and the complex with the substrate, then found, no, then uh, proposed that glu 51 this amino acid, is responsible for the ventilation as shown in this figure. So this amino acid GLU51 is responsible for deprotonation and subsequent nucleophilic attack to for the ventilation. So this amino acid 51 G, uh, glutamic acid is located at this position after sequence alignment. So we can see this, this amino acid is really conserved across the cyanopatin and the transferase. So we, we started to thinking if we mutate this amino acid, there will be some changes with the ventilation. So, so we proceed with that idea and we make a mutant by changing the glutamic acid into alanine. And we found there's no ventilation after that. So this result actually uh, also supported by a paper that had been published this year, or last week, we published last week. So this paper also do a similar experiment as our. So mutating the same our uh, position at here also resulted in no ventilation. So after we determine the uh, catalytic residue and also the protein function, we try to know the protein behavior, the chemo selectivity, whether this IGCS penis transferase can accept a different type of uh, Analog, for example, a cyclic peptide with with serine or tyroxine or lysine or tryptophan. So we try to create this. We synthesize this cyclic peptide for as a substrate to test the protein promiscuity and also the linear peptide. So in the end, we found that. This AGCF is only accept a cyclic peptide with an arginine residue at this position one. So with this, this information, we, we will continue for the biocatalyst bio development. So, so now it's almost the end of the presentation. So why? We doing this. Is this all important? So let me explain the background of the peptide as a drug discovery. So over the decade, the peptide has been 
uh, product discovery have been increases over the decade, as shown in this paper. But there's one major weakness of peptide because peptide usually can be detected by the human protein. So one way to overcome this weakness is this drawback is by overcome with the limitation by introducing annihilation to the peptide. So one example is this one. This is a FDA approved drug, semaglutide. So basically it's a peptide, but the peptide is introducing with a limitation and here I highlighted in red color. So by introducing the repetition, it not only it could overcome by the degradation in human body, but also increases the medicinal value. So we can see a similar trend at here. You can see the non venerated peptide have a very weak antibacterial activity. So when there's a mono venerated product, the activity is increases. And once there's a base veneration at this moiety, antibacterial activity increases significantly. So with this, I mean, with this idea in our mind, we try to make a biocatalyst. So first, we have opened the door, we have found a new tool for peptide modification, and which have opened the door for protein engineering to create a useful biocatalyst. And this can be applied in pharmaceutical industry, where people synthesize a lot of cyclic peptide with arginine as a position one, and mixing with, with our protein, it could generate hunger of different cyclic peptide benedicted cyclopeptide like this one here, as for the screening of antibiotics. So we can predict the function, uh, the application function for this protein that we have found. So this is one example, how important is the biocatalyst in industry? So this is the starting material, which is converted by this enzyme biocatalyst and changes to here and which can be used to uh, follow out synthesis to make a commercial drug singular. So this one has been patterned by the cortexes and also MUD, which is a pharmaceutical industry in USA. So this show the potential of biocatalysis in industry. So we can see the, the future function they can bring to us. So that's why uh, our group has a uh, pattern, uh, this protein. So this pattern is shared with Hokkaido University. And finally, um, this is the end. This is the last page of the presentation. So I would like to acknowledge uh, Professor Tosuki Wakimoto of, and also Professor Tosufumi Okino, and and the work is shared with the uh, Dr. Kenichi Masuda and the student Nanani Baro and Keiji Fujita. And this work is supported by Jasper's Postdoc Fellowship, the funding, and also the facility from Hokkaido University. So. I'm done and I'm happy to answer if there's any question. Thank you very much, Dr. Chin Sun Pan, for the very interesting topic that you have delivered today. Um, for the audience, feel free to drop any question in the chat box so I can read. If the, there is no question, I have myself one question. Uh, can you explain a bit, you know, the flow of your in vitro uh, experiment, you know, from starting to the end? You know, it's a bit like you are showing us the, the result, but we are curious to know, I mean, the flow of, exper of experiment. 
the flow of in vitro assay like this one? Yes, yes, yes. How how, so, how do you do it? Yes. First, we culture and adjust the OD with a wavelength of 600 nanometer. We adjust the OD until 0. Point, no, is it? Yeah, 0. 0.5. And then we, we add the IBDG inducer to express the protein and culture in low temperature, like 16 degrees Celsius overnight. After that, we centrifuge and get the cell backlog and sonicate breakdown, hydrolyze the cells backlog to get the protein, which is this one, HCF. And then we need to purify the protein using a nickel affinity column. After we purify the protein, we do a stash page like this one to see the purity of the protein. If the result is good, like I get a single pen, we plot it with the in vitro assay. So the in vitro assay is after purify this protein, this protein will be missing with this substrate, compound tray, and also the other pole factor, like magnesium chloride and other things. So all these are actually recorded in the paper. You can see it in the supporting information. So basically we purify the protein, mix with the substrate, which is compound tray, and also the cofactor, and incubate in 37 degrees Celsius. And we stop the reaction by adding the methanol inside the protein. Yeah, just like that. Okay, thank you very much. Did uh, I answer your question? Yes, yes. We have a question from the chat box uh, from Dr. Sarah Hani. Thank you for the insightful talk. Could you explain how do you construct the sequence similarity network of cyanobactin phenyl transferase? Oh, all right. Um, so, to construct this um, similarity network, first, uh, we need to collect thousands of the phenyl transferase amino acid sequence. By doing that, there are a similar way to do that because there are a lot of genomic database uh, right now. For example, JGI from the USA and also NCPI or Interpol and uh, Tiger Farm like this. So basically we, we collect the amino acid sequence using our plotting HGCF from, for example, in NCPI. We, we get thousand of that. And then after we get that thousand of that, we do some bioinformatic technique uh, to process the amino acid sequence. And then we submit to the to this web tool that published in Biochem Biochemistry 2019. So after we after we submit the alignment, uh, I mean the sequence, amino acid sequence and the alignment to this uh, to this web two, it can generate a network, something like this. <laughs> okay, thank you very yeah, much. Uh, yes, so we have another question. How do you decide the, the mutagenesis of the E54A? Is there any reason why alanine is chosen to substitute glutamine? Oh, oh, all right. Um, please wait. So, so, um, I understand the question. Uh, actually, if we, if I'm, a, if our group is the first group that doing this, it will be very difficult, almost impossible, unless we have a crystal structure of the protein. But luckily, as I saw, we are not the first group doing that. It have been uh, about 10 years. So the protein structure, the s -ray is already been done at here. So what we do is we can see the protein structure from this paper, 2016. So this paper proposed that glutamic acid at here have a function to deprotonate this tyroxine. And then adding the planning group at here. 
So this is a proposal in this paper. It has no experiment been carried out. So we just try because this amino acid is very conserved. So we just try and change that, um, make this mutant B to B49 to air, and we found there's no activity. Why we use A alanine is because we can see the glutamic acid have this OH functionality and become uh, this OH can deploy on make the, the catalytic residue and also and that acting the plenty group. So we, we change a non charged uh, amino acids, for example, alanine, most likely this type of catalytic activity. Uh, will not have this type of catalytic activity. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question. Would it be possible to isolate or identify the cyanobactin gene from the environmental sample without culturing uh, the actual cyanobacterial strain? So, so I guess this question is asking, asking about the metagenomic study. So we can, many people have been done there and once the group, the foremost of all is the John Peel. So John Peel, Professor John Peel from Switzerland is the first person that doing a metagenomic on the spawns and getting the bacteria from the spawns surface. And he has success of doing that experiment. Uh, from my knowledge, there's no people doing the metagenomic on cyanobacteria. Um, I'm not sure, is it possible or not? Okay, I think that answered the question just now. Uh, is there any question anymore from the floor? Okay, I think um, we have come to the end of the webinar. I would like to thank Dr. Chin Sun Pan for a very interesting subject and I'm sure this topic has opened up our view and give you an idea on how you want to bring up your research output to the next level. Okay, today's webinar has recorded around more than 30 participants on Cisco WebEx. Uh, so we have uh, as well in Facebook, uh, Facebook Live page in Viruses UKM. Okay, before we say goodbye, let us immortalize this session by switching on your video and have our faces captured. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, kindly please switch on your camera uh, for photography session. Okay, um, the first page, uh, get ready in three, two, one. Right down, and then the next page. I'm um, ready in three, two, one. All right, that's all. Thank you. I also would like to thank to all participants for spending your time with us today, uh, Dr. Chin Soon. I would like for you, uh, I would like to invite you for breakout session. Can you wait for the breakout session? Um, please stay safe and take good care. Goodbye. We will have the link, uh, um, the attendance link in the chat box.